Great. So again, welcome everybody. This is Andrew Hone, President and CEO of the Portland Business Alliance. So glad you're all with us today. Uh, we are so grateful for tools such as Zoom to keep us connected in this uh, physically distanced world. Uh, I hope everybody at the Alliance, uh, we are wishing all of you well uh, and making sure that you all do your part to be safe and stay healthy, practice good physical distancing and help all of us flatten the curve. I also want to acknowledge clearly uh, the folks that are on the front lines of the healthcare crisis, the workers uh, in our hospital systems and also delivering our food and making sure our economy can keep humming under these unusual circumstances. We can't thank you enough. Huge thanks to many of the members on this call who answered our repeated asks for support uh, for personal protective equipment and many other charitable donations to folks that need it right now. Uh, the innovation and contributions of the business community are noted and appreciated by far more than us, but really uh, everyone in the state of Oregon uh, who ben benefits from your actions. And as I've mentioned before, the Alliance is here to be a resource for all of you. We have an incredible website and landing page for businesses to access those re resources, which is www.portlandalliance.com forward slash COVID-19. And of course, uh, you know, hey, we're all still connected for better or for worse on social media. So you can find us on Twitter, on Instagram and elsewhere at PDX underscore Biz Alliance. And of course, hashtag PBA events, even though these are a new style of events. A recording of this presentation and links for resources mentioned will be available shortly after we wrap up this morning. Uh, of course, none of these events could be possible without your membership and just appreciating all those who are on this uh, forum, who are members of the Alliance, uh, your support means more now than ever, so thank you. And today I wanna thank our video forum sponsors. It's, uh, it's interesting, uh, just only uh, a couple months ago, we were in person at the Hilton and over at the Sentinel and we continue to have such great support from uh, Key Bank and Portland Tribune. I think it's really notable that uh, the dependence that we have on media and successful media is really critical. And we have the Trib to thank for getting great information out there. And we have a wonderful moderator from the Oregonian. Remember to support your local media. And of course, with Key Bank, the banks are truly on the front lines of providing relief to so many of our small businesses who are in desperate need right now. So thank you. Uh, both. And with that, I am just pleased to introduce to all of you uh, on this forum uh, call today, our key bank representative and proud board member, I'm assuming proud, uh, Michelle Weisenbach with Key Bank. Thank you so much for joining us today, Michelle. It's good to see you. Thank you, Andrew. Good morning, everyone. It is such a pleasure to be here, um, figuratively, if not literally, as we all stay home and stay safe. You know, as a longtime sponsor of this monthly series, we at KeyBank are so thrilled that the Portland Business Alliance chose to go ahead with today's event and share this um, wonderful information and have this chance to talk with our candidates as we hold what is a virtual event today. Um, I know I've gotten a lot of practice in holding these types of forums and using Zoom and all forms of social media and whatnot is over the past few weeks we've really been working to come together as we support our employees and our um, business community and our consumers that are really going through some challenging times today and I suspect you all too have figured out you know what's the right angle and how do I make my chins not look big as we're doing all of our video conferencing um, at KeyBank our mission is to help our communities thrive and I think you'll all agree we need that more today than we ever have. And as we think about navigating new ways to work and come together, we always want to make sure we're maintaining a focus on all aspects of wellness, be it our physical, mental, and financial wellness. And you know, we are spending a lot of time working, you know, on the SBA program and our work. And you know, it's very satisfying to, to see the effects of that. I'm so proud of the efforts that KeyBank has made to support our employees, our clients, and the community in these challenging times. And our sponsorship of forums like this one is one of the ways that we contribute to bringing folks together. So thank you, Portland Business Alliance, and our guests for what is sure to be a fascinating program today. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks so much, Michelle. And, you know, I just got a, a, a peek as I uh, cyber uh, follow uh, Michelle 
that within hours of the opening of the SBA programs, uh, KeyBank had received tens of thousands of applications and your bankers were able to process that. So to you and, and really your entire team, thank you for what you're doing. Much appreciated. Also with us today uh, from the Portland Tribune is John Schrag. Uh, so please, John, um, thank you for your support today and thank you for everything you and, and please pass on our regards to Mark Garber for, for the work that the Trib is doing uh, and making sure that media is keeping us all up to date. Uh, and we appreciate you being here on the call with us. So John, uh, take it away. Yeah, well, thanks uh, back to you, Andrew, and, and the Portland Business Alliance for continuing uh, what really is an important tradition in such very unusual times. You know, I've been in this profession long enough to have gone through 9-11, the dot-com bust, the disruptive rise of social media, the fallout of the Great Recession, and honestly, nothing compares to this. Um, in this age, I think, of stay home, work home, campaign home, uh, we're all realizing things that we took for granted, uh, things that like that people seeking public office would show up at multiple public forums where voters could actually hear firsthand their views on a variety of topics. Um, and that talented, trusted journalists like Noel Crombie um, would be there to compare their rhetoric to their records. Uh, there is such an incredible demand for our news right now. And as Andrew mentioned, it comes at a time of real challenges for us. Our, our ability to pay for it has been severely compromised. So this is a business forum, so let me take just a couple seconds and talk business. Over a period of five days last month, news organizations like the Oregonian, Portland Business Journal, Pamplin Media Group, we lost 70 to 50% of our advertising revenue. And ad revenue pays for 50 to 80% of our bills. Journalists are notoriously bad at math, but even I could figure out that's not a good equation. Um, now newsrooms with strong print components have two big expenses, paper and people. And if you're watching closely, you will notice that there are fewer news pages being printed in Portland and sadly, fewer bylines on those pages. Like everyone else, we're hoping that business rebounds and with it, the advertising revenue that will let us bring back those jobs and pages. But given the uncertainty of the timing and scope of the recovery, we also need to ask you, our readers, the business community, listeners and viewers to step up and please pay for your news. We have never asked that before so directly, but we are doing so now. If you're one of those folks who are reading uh, Noel's coverage in Oregon Live for free, knock it off. The Oregonian is accepting voluntary online subscriptions. Sign up today. If you're avoiding the premium content on the Portland Business Journal's website, stop it. And by all means, if you don't have a subscription to the Pamplin Media Group, please go to savinglocalnews.com and sign up as soon as this forum is over so that you'll be able to read all your community root, um, news as well as our coverage and endorsement in this race. Speaking of which, I wanna end by reminding the candidates that our endorsement has not yet been written. So we'll be watching closely over the next few minutes. No pressure there, gentlemen. And since we're living in somewhat dystopian times, let me reach back to the Hunger Games and add, may the odds be ever in your favor. <laughs> I'll take that. Uh, really appreciate that, John. And and truly, for all of you out there, uh, our our journalists uh, are going to be depending on these subscriptions, uh, us as readers and listeners and viewers. So uh, just to reiterate that, we have great two great media outlets here that are with us right now. So encouraging all of you to support them in these special times and get up there and subscribe. So John John laid it out more directly, but I appreciate that call out. We all should. Uh, so thank you again to our sponsors, uh, and each month we invite a journalist uh, from the community to join us as a moderator in these, uh, in these sessions and informative discussions. And, and before I turn it over to our moderator, I do want to just take a moment to say to our two candidates, Ethan Knight and Mike Schmidt, we appreciate the fact that you are willing to run for office, uh, that you're out there presenting your vision for how uh, our community should be and that you're taking that step. Uh, we need folks that are engaged and we need uh, people to be running for office. And so just, it can sometimes be a thankless job, but but truly uh, we appreciate that you're engaged and that you're joining us here today. So from the entire business community, we appreciate your engagement. Uh, and I know that our moderator, Noel Crombie, uh, who is a senior staff writer with the Oregonian, full disclosure, uh, the publisher of the Oregonian is on the executive committee of the Portland Business Alliance. John Maher is a great guy but we appreciate it that you're here with us today, Noelle, and uh, please take it from here. Good morning, everyone. As a journalist with the state's largest news organization, I'm taking a few moments away from covering the coronavirus pandemic, which has stretched the resources of our newsroom 
My colleagues and I are dedicated to bringing Oregonians vital information at this crucial time. This morning, we're holding a discussion between the two candidates running for Multnomah County District Attorney, Ethan Knight and Mike Schmidt, to learn about how they would approach the role of district attorney. Each candidate will have a moment to introduce themselves, and then we will go through a series of questions ranging from housing and homelessness, law enforcement and sentencing, to, to county budgets. Answers by each candidate will be limited to two minutes. For those listening in, our candidates were provided topics ahead of time, but not the specific questions. While this is not a debate, if there are comments a candidate would like to make in response to a previous answer, they may do so during their time on the next question. We'll start alphabetically, allowing each candidate two and a half minutes to share with you who they are and why they are running for Multnomah County DA. Ethan, if you could please start, start us off this morning and tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're running for DA. Thank you all uh, so much for joining us virtually this morning. Uh, and thank you to the Portland Business Alliance uh, for this opportunity, uh, which uh, increasingly are few and far between, uh, and it's very much appreciated. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about why I want to be your next Multnomah County District Attorney. Uh, I am running for one simple reason, and it really animates uh, all that I've done in the last two decades as a state and federal prosecutor. I love this community, and I see a tremendous need not just to be the next Chief Law Enforcement Officer of Multnomah County, but also to restore and underscore the credibility that's needed in our public space, particularly in this job. Uh, I've spent, again, roughly 20 years as a state and federal prosecutor, uh, handling virtually every type of case that this city in this state, and in some respects, this country has seen, ranging from the smallest of crimes uh, to the biggest, including terrorism and national security. Uh, and I've been very active in the community during that time. Uh, but having said all that, uh, I wanna talk about briefly at the beginning here, what I view uh, is the two biggest priorities for law enforcement and public safety in the coming months and years. Now, the first I'll tell you, uh, and I've been speaking about this since the beginning of the campaign, is our ability and the importance of dealing with the lowest level offenders, the misdemeanor crimes, the low level felonies, really the quality of life crimes. You know, in my uh, 20 years of being a prosecutor, uh, I've noticed and I know that the big cases uh, drive headlines and get lots of attention and they're important, but they'll get done anyway. What really impacts uh, the day-to-day -day livelihoods, the day-to-day -day feelings of safety and security, uh, and really the day-to-day -day, uh, viability of any community are the low-level crimes, those misdemeanors and low-level felonies. So what I wanna talk about, and what I have been talking about, is how do we best and most efficiently leverage the resources we do have in the criminal justice system in enforcing the rule of law, but also respecting the boundaries and limits of what the criminal justice system can do. And lastly, I'll say, and this is a new issue, but I think the most significant, it's how do we navigate this challenge and do this in an environment that's increasingly going to be challenged by the economic and social disruption of COVID-19. The reality is this will alter the landscape of the criminal justice system and our resources, uh, and it should drive the decision-making that we all have to make in the coming months and years. And it's not a fortunate situation, uh, but it's one I'm willing to take on head on, and that's why I wanna be your next district attorney. Thank you. Mike, your turn. Could you please tell us a little bit about why you're running for DA? Thanks, Noel, and thank you to the Business Alliance for putting this on. Uh, this truly is a really important time for us to continue to be connected and have these conversations. I'm running for DA ultimately because I believe we need major reform now. I started off my career as a high school teacher in the city of New Orleans, where I saw firsthand the school to prison pipeline. I decided to go to law school and I came to Lewis and Clark here in Portland and I studied criminal law and I got a job in the Multnomah County District Attorney's Office thinking that I could be the change from within. And while I felt like I was helping people, I didn't feel like I was changing anything. Uh, in fact, I started to feel like the system was starting to change me. I got out in 2013 after prosecuting for that length of time, 2007 to 2013. Uh, and joined the legislature working on policy and ultimately was hired by the Criminal Justice Commission. In that state agency, we work on research and evidence into what works to reduce crime. I was appointed to be the director of that state agency in 2015 by Governor Kitzhaber, and I've been the director ever since. During my tenure as director, 
I've tripled the staff and almost tripled our budget to the point where now I preside over a $90 million state agency. And what I've learned since being the director is that we're seeing increasingly hearing from our jail commanders, our sheriffs, our director of corrections, that our jails and our prisons are our largest homeless shelters. They're our largest mental health treatment facilities. They're our largest drug addiction treatment facilities. And that's fundamentally a system that is not working. So I'm running to be district attorney because I know that we can do better. I've laid out a progressive platform of 28 different points that I think we should start working on, uh, including standing up for our immigrant community uh, and standing up to ICE and saying that if you're a victim of a crime, you can still come and report that so we can keep our community safe. Holding police officers accountable. Uh, officers have a tremendously difficult job and most of them do it with incredible valor. But as we've seen in the recent West Lynn case, sometimes they step over the line and we need to have a prosecutor that will hold them accountable. And ultimately, giving people hope. If you get caught in the criminal justice system at one of your lowest moments, you need to have a way out. And we need to be there and say, if you do the hard work, we're going to hold you accountable. But if you do the treatment and you get yourself rehabilitated and you don't commit any more crimes, we're going to be there to give you a chance and get rid of those uh, old convictions. So that's why I'm running for DA. Thank you. On to our next question. And a reminder for guests and for those listening today that each candidate has two minutes to answer the question. This is not a debate, but an opportunity to share with our audience uh, your perspective. Uh, let's start with Mike. Mike, if elected as DA, what are your top public safety priorities for the community and why? Right off the bat, you know, one of my top priorities is going to be um, transparency and legitimacy in the system. I think nationally and locally, we're seeing that ultimately members of our community, are they've lost faith uh, that the system is fair. Um, we see rampant disparity. We see that we're spending millions and millions of dollars on incarceration, but recidivism rates are unchanged. We're not getting any better results. What I've done at the Criminal Justice Commission as director is made data available to the entire public. So you can go on there and see in a dashboard arrest rates and conviction rates and incarceration. District attorneys, not only in Multnomah County, but across the country are notoriously black boxes of information. I wanna make that public. I wanna let people see what's going on. And ultimately, I wanna focus our resources on increasing public safety, not just how many cases we prosecute or how many convictions we get, but literally, how is crime in our community? Are we having an impact or not? Are our sentencing decisions uh, having the impact that we want to increase public safety? So my top priorities are gonna be transparency, legitimacy, uh, being an advocate for our uh, local district attorney's uh, office, both at the statewide level and at the local level, uh, because I think we are gonna be facing some challenging times here in the near future. Thank you. Ethan, your priorities? My priorities, again, are how do we deal with the low-level offenses that uh, really plague our system and affect people on a day-to-day -day basis? And also, how do we do that in a way that underscores the credibility of the system and our institutions in an area era where our resources are going to be depleted? And I'll just tell you, you know, briefly by way of anecdote, uh, you know, when I was a student at Lincoln High School 30-some years ago, uh, I had no problem walking from Lincoln down to the Multnomah County Library. Uh, I've got a student at Lincoln right now. Uh, I'm not so sure I'd want him making that same walk and hanging around in your library. And you know, that's kind of a prosaic explanation of what I think is wrong right now. Uh, and there are things we need to do with respect to policy and data, but the bottom line is, unless people feel safe and we can deal with our lowest level offenders in a humane way, uh, we are gonna lose what's great about this community uh, and this city. And that really is why that is my number one public safety priority. Uh, there are ways to do it right. There's a need to return to community prosecution, uh, to engage law enforcement more proactively in solving problems. And I have experience doing that on the ground as a prosecutor, as a supervisor of prosecutors uh, over the last two decades. And this all needs to be done by someone who's independent and has the support of the institutions and the folks in the legal community and our first responders uh, and who knows uh, how we do these things and make the changes we need to make. So again, that's my number one priority in an era that I think will be increasingly challenged economically and socially. 
Thank you both. Let's move on to the next question. Local and statewide polls show that housing and homelessness are by far the top priority of voters in 2020. With the economic crisis of the COVID-19 pandemic, we may see an increase in the number of people at risk of or experiencing homelessness. In your view, what role can the DA play in addressing issues related to homelessness? And I'll let Ethan start with this one. Absolutely. Well, I mean, I think, uh, but for the you know fiscal crisis we're entering into, homelessness is the number one issue facing this community. Uh, and there is overlap with the criminal justice system and the district attorney. I think at the outset, it's important to recognize and remind people that homelessness is not criminal uh, and that being, homelessness, being homeless is not a crime. Um, but it's also important to remember that individuals who are experiencing homelessness often come in contact with the system. So what the district attorney can do and should do is leverage that point of contact more efficiently and effectively. And that means a couple different things. It means, again, returning to a community prosecution-based model with community court and community prosecutors that I helped create two decades ago. It means identifying the effective addiction and treatment courts and programs that work and it means identifying the individuals who may be homeless who are victimizing other homeless individuals. You know, for example, the rate of sexual assault amongst folks who are experiencing homelessness is extraordinary. Women who are homeless are victimized at a rate five to 10 times higher than those who are not. Uh, so we need to do a better job of investigating and prosecuting those crimes, as well as identifying the folks who are committing the lion's share of property crimes that impact that quality of life I've talked about since we began today. So the district attorney can't solve all those problems, uh, but he or she can solve a number of them. And that's what I intend to do. And I'll say lastly, uh, that that role, the role of district attorney should be a more vocal and visible role in confronting these problems. And that's what I see as the number one issue in our community. Mike? Yeah, uh, you know, agree on a lot of those points. Uh, I was really happy to be invited and attend a, a PBA forum a, a, a I guess a month ago now at this point, it seems like forever ago, uh, where the Business Alliance really laid out the causes and where we see homelessness on the rise in different communities across our country. And the bottom line that was pointed out was that when you see rents and cost of living and housing go up, you see homelessness increase. That's what's driving this, is, is a lack of those resources and the costs that it takes. So the criminal justice system is not the answer to those issues. Now, we do have a role to play. And when people who are houseless and they're living on our streets are committing crimes, uh, such as property crimes or sexual assault, uh, Ethan brought that up, but also um, I saw, I've seen data that says that uh, folks who are living on the streets, uh, out of the 29 murders in 2017, I believe it was, 10 of those people in our city were, were homeless. So, I mean, they are just absolutely a very victimized and traumatized community. I think the district attorney can play a role in focusing and working with other partners like I've done at the Criminal Justice Commission, working with the health authority, working with our other systems, our foster care system, to see that sometimes the decisions that the district attorney makes can have negative impacts and keep people uh, from being able to access resources. Uh, getting expungements and convictions off of people's records when they've done the job of getting their lives back on track we make them wait 10 years uh, to get those by statute frequently. We can do that. The research says after five years, you're no more likely to commit another crime than anybody else. Let's give them some hope so that if they're doing all the right things, they can get back on their feet, get jobs, get housing, and access the resources that we want them to. Thank you. The next question. Voters overwhelmingly cite additional funding for drug and alcohol treatment as their top solution to addressing homelessness and issues rooted in addiction. Downtown Portland Clean and Safe reported picking up more than 50,000 needles from downtown alone in 2019. As DA, how would you approach drug dealing, vehicle break-ins, vandalism, and other crimes associated with addiction? Mike. Yeah, so uh, all those crimes that you just listed off, Noel, I mean, those are crimes that, that have to have a criminal justice system response. So you said drug dealing uh, and, and vandalism. Those are things, those are crimes that we need to hold people accountable for. But as voters have said in, in the polling that you reference, 
what we're really trying to accomplish is not necessarily that those people need to be punished and put away and locked up, but we need to get at what is driving the criminality. What is at the core of it? And it is, it's addiction, it's mental health treatment. Those are issues I've been working on for the last six years at the Criminal Justice Commission. My agency makes investments all over the state. Uh, we control, like they said, a $90 million budget into drug courts, uh, into justice reinvestment programs. Uh, we provide technical assistance to communities all across Oregon and how to reach those issues. So it's something I have a ton of experience in uh, and knowing not only what the research says and what works, how do we make those investments? And as a deputy district attorney, I was also a drug court deputy. So I know what it's like to be in the drug courts working on those issues. So my focus is gonna be hold people accountable for those crimes, but let's get them the treatment and the things that we need because we know when they get that, they're less likely to end up committing more crimes than if we send them to prison for a couple of years where they're not gonna get treatment, they're not gonna get addiction help, and then they're gonna be right back onto our streets after not addressing any of those issues. Uh, and that's just a recipe for, for bad public safety outcomes. Ethan? Absolutely. So the question is, what would I do as district attorney to address those problems in the context of public opinion? And let me just say, as someone who spent a lot of time in the system, uh, I think there's a disconnect. Uh, you know, we all recognize the importance of treatment and recognize uh, really those acute issues uh, that folks see, uh, you know, on the streets, frankly. Um, but what we have not done uh, is adequately supported and funded the criminal justice system's uh, efforts to address those problems. Uh, you know, Mike's right, and the reality is we don't send those people to prison, and that's not the answer usually with those uh, folks at all. But the other problem is we have not adequately funded addiction and treatment services in the criminal justice system. Uh, so in other words, we'll sentence folks, and I know this because I've supervised and run the unit in the DA's office that deals with misdemeanor intake offenses. Um, we'll, you know, send someone to jail for 30 days, refer them to treatment, and think we've solved the problem. Uh, but to do it right, you need to have an aggressive, proactive approach that involves the criminal justice system, that commits the resources to treatment on the mental health and addiction side, and involves prosecutors in that process. And that's what I've been talking about since the beginning of this campaign. You know, it's not an either or solution. Uh, we don't get to say, look, we love addiction and treatment, therefore we should defund criminal justice. Because if you play that game, uh, the problem's only gonna get worse. Uh, so what I can tell you is to address those crimes that you listed and that I've been talking to voters about for eight months, we need to have an all hands on deck approach involving the criminal justice system and involving those stakeholders. Thank you. Let's move on. Uh, Portland has essentially the same size police force we had in the mid 90s, yet our population has grown by over 30% since then. Do you think adding police officers to the force would help address some of the law enforcement challenges Portland faces? Are there strategies you think law enforcement should consider in addressing these issues? I'm going to let Ethan start this one. So uh, as to the first part of the question, yes, I think we do need to increase the size of the police force. I mean, I don't support the notion that you just blindly add officers to increase arrests. And that gets to the second part of your question, um, which is, are there ways we can do it and things we can focus on? So, you know, the police bureau um, is woefully under-resourced. And the consequence of that is you can't do the kind of proactive, thoughtful policing that makes an impact in a community. Uh, and the reality is when the police only respond uh, to severe 911 calls, they're totally reactive and demoralized. And that doesn't make people feel safe. Uh, it doesn't address the underlying causes of criminal behavior, which, you know, the police remarkably can be quite effective in doing if they've got the time uh, to respond. And so when I talk about community prosecution, uh, you know, having officers out of their cars in neighborhoods, meeting with vulnerable populations and building those bridges, that's exactly what you can do when you have an adequately sized police force that really uh, is proportional to the city and the community you have. Um, so we need that. And you know, prosecution uh, can only be effective if we have partners in law enforcement and first responders who have the resources and support we need. And the police don't always get it right, uh, but they work very hard and they have a hard job. I'm proud to be supported by the police, the fire bureau, our first responders who know on the front lines, we need those resources to get it right. And so I would support increased officers, but to do so in a way 
uh, that's mindful of this community and the resources we need and a more community oriented approach to policing. Mike? Uh, so I agree that, that we need more police officers. Uh, and But I don't know that the issue is necessarily a budgetary one. Uh, my understanding from talking to local officials is that the police force currently has over 100 vacancies that they can't fill. Uh, and that I've talked to law enforcement across the entire state, and this is something that all law enforcement agencies are going through, uh, the state police, corrections, all across our system, that they cannot fill those positions fast enough with qualified applicants uh, to compensate for the number of people retiring from our force. And I think that gets back to one of the things I started off with, which is a crisis of legitimacy in the criminal justice system. We cannot attract enough people that want to do this incredibly challenging, hard work. Uh, and so we need to make sure that we're doing everything we can to make sure officers know that if they take these jobs and they come into our communities, that they're going to be supported by our communities. I talked to a, a deputy district attorney who told me, uh, you know, when he gets his hair cut, uh, that when the person cutting his hair asked him what he does, he just says, I work for the state. You know, and if they press even further, say, oh, well, you know, in law enforcement. But, you know, people are, are not even willing to admit that they are, there are public safety officers. That's a problem. That's a problem when we're trying to recruit new people into our system. So we need to rebuild trust with our community uh, to make it more transparent, to make sure that the community knows that we're holding folks accountable. Uh, and that they can trust our law enforcement officers to, to do the right job. So we need to fill those vacancies uh, that are sitting out there. We need to recruit a more diverse work staff that's going to help us uh, build that trust with the community. Uh, and then we should be looking at, you know, exactly what's going on with crime. Are having those additional 100 officers, are they decreasing crime? I agree neighborhood prosecution and neighborhood officers uh, is absolutely uh, the right way to go. But those things also take a lot of budget. And I think we're coming to some seriously tough budgetary times. Uh, so we need somebody, a district attorney, who knows how to navigate those waters. And I've worked with federal funds, with state funds, with local funds. I'm proud to be supported by the entire county commission, two of the city commissioners, uh, chairs of ways and means. So I know how to get the funding and the resources. And I already have those networks on day one. So I'll be an advocate for getting resources into our system. Thank you. As reported last week, Multnomah County is now likely facing a budget shortfall as a result of the COVID-19 crisis. This will likely impact programs such as community corrections, which has already experienced a strain on capacity. As DA, how would you advocate for funding for the office? Mike, do you want to start this one? Great. So it kind of dovetails with my last point. Um, you know, so at the Criminal Justice Commission, uh, like I said, I oversee a very large budget that makes these investments across the state. So I've already built relationships with the co-chairs of the Public Safety Sub of Ways and Means. I'm endorsed by both of them. I'm endorsed by two of the co-chairs of Ways and Means, uh, by the chair of the Health Committee. Those are the relationships that they control the community corrections budget. So if you don't already have those relationships with those folks and they don't already have, uh, you know, your support of your vision, uh, it's going to be tough sledding to, to make sure that they know what kind of investments that they need to make. Luckily, those are all people that will pick up the phone when I make a phone call. So I think part of it is, is knowing where the right levers are. There's also federal funds available. The federal burn JAG grants are something that I've administered for the last six years. We actually fought with the Trump administration to restore those grants uh, because they cut off that critical public safety funding because we are a so-called sanctuary state. We fought them in court. We won that. Those funds are now restored. So there's federal funds. The county funds are also there, you know, and having relationships with the county commission uh, is going to be crucial to building those alliances and making sure that the investments that they're making are done in a way that, that, co that align with their values and their vision for the community. So that's going to be, uh, you know, crucial that whoever has this job on day one doesn't have to learn who all these people are, doesn't have to build relationships but they already know how to go. And I think that's gonna be key to navigating this complex agency through really hard budgetary times, not only at the city level, the county level, the state level, and at the federal level. All of those are gonna be feeling a budgetary crunch. So having somebody that knows uh, where all those levers are and how those funding streams work and how to access them uh, is gonna be crucial. Ethan, how would you advocate for funding for the office? 
Well, I think it's important to start by knowing that the county commissioners and the state legislators uh, that Mike's alluding to who are supporting him have been cutting uh, criminal justice in the DA's office uh, even before we entered into this crisis. Uh, so I don't see how, uh, you know, it, I, I, it's intellectually, um, you know, linear to say that, you know, on day one, facing this budgetary crisis, you call the county commission who's been cutting your budget uh, annually and say, now I need more money. That's not going to happen. Uh, and I, you know, I think Mike and I agree that we're entering into an extraordinarily difficult budgetary time, but I view the position and the role differently. Look, I've handled public corruption cases for years. I've been in the system for years. I'm supported by the current district attorney. I view the role of the district attorney in the context of the budget, as in other things, as an independent public advocate. And that's precisely what I would be. I mean, I think the reality is on the budget, we're gonna have to make choices. Uh, the DA's office is a small percentage of the county general fund, uh, but not one that has been supported. And I would view my role is to publicly advocate with the business community, with neighborhood associations, with the community at large for more support for law enforcement, because I think it is necessary for a viable and safe community. And I think it's gonna be extraordinarily difficult, uh, but I'm up to the task and that's precisely how I see the job, is to be that public advocate. And that's what we need in this community. And candidly, I'm not running for this job to acquiesce to the status quo. I'm not interested in doing that. I'm interested in advocating on behalf of the people of this community, something that I've done for two decades. We'll move on to the next question. In the most recent survey conducted by Downtown Portland Clean and Safe, businesses located in the city center expressed concerns over public safety. As DA, how would you approach the unique issues around public safety in Downtown Portland? I will let Ethan take this for question first. Well, this gets to what I alluded to earlier about, you know, my memories of going downtown 30 years ago and my son's now and uh, as someone who works down there. Um, and I love downtown Portland and uh, I worry about its future, particularly in light of, I think, the economic phase we're moving into and what's going to happen to commercial real estate uh, and real retail space. Uh, that's kind of an aside, but I think it's related to the criminal justice issues we face. Uh, that's why, to me, I get back to what I started with uh, as a priority, and that is how do we best address the low-level offenses uh, that affect the feelings of livability and really the psychology attendant uh, to coming downtown and what downtown Portland looks like. Uh, you know, I think one big piece is going to be working with the police bureau. Uh, it's going to be, uh, you know, uh, helping improve the community court program that I helped create two de decades ago downtown. Uh, but it's going to take more than that. I mean, it's going to take an acknowledgement um, and work to see uh, that, you know, crime does have an impact on people's lives and livelihoods. Uh, and until we get to that point and acknowledge that that's a piece of the puzzle, I don't think we're going to get very far in discussing and solving this problem. So I get back to what is my number one priority, and that is how to best and most fairly deal with low-level offenses, and that's what we do downtown. And we do it through those addiction courts. We do it through targeted prosecutions of our worst offenders, and we do it by partner, partnering on the addiction side and with community justice uh, to deal with those low-level offenses. Mike? Yeah, you know, I think what's clear is that what we're doing isn't working. Uh, just catch and release, arrest, prosecution, pushing people through a, just a conveyor belt of justice is not getting us the results uh, that we need to see. We need to be more focused on what are the solutions? How do we actually change somebody's trajectory? Putting someone in jail for a low level crime for two or three days or even a few hours uh, is not changing their behavior. It's not getting at the root causes of the problem. I was proud to partner with uh, council state governments and the Oregon Health Authority on a study that looked at this issue. Uh, some of you may or may not be aware that what the state picks up in terms of funding for community corrections is for felony supervision, not misdemeanor supervision. Misdemeanor supervision is a county function that is paid for by, by the local county. So we partnered with those entities with the Oregon Health Authority to say, who is driving the costs in our local systems? Something the state has, doesn't really have a financial interest in. And what we found is that the vast of all the people arrested uh, over a, a year's basis, we looked at jail data from over 12 counties, 
Uh, and we looked at, and what we saw was that 9% of all the people that are arrested uh, over the course of the year, they take up 30% of our jail bookings. For the first time ever, we merged that data with health data. And we said, How, what kind of impact is this having on our health system? And what we saw was that that same group of folks are 150% more likely than their peers on, on OHP, on Medicaid, to be in our emergency departments. They're 650% more likely to have co-occurring substance use and mental health issues. They're an extremely sick and needy and high intense need population, but they're just spinning in our criminal justice system over and over and over again in this revolving door. So I advocated to the legislature and we got passed in Senate Bill 973 that they invest $10 million so we can try some pilot programs across our state. And we're in the process of building out that application right now. Unfortunately, because of COVID-19, of course, things are a little bit slowed down. But we're gonna get pilot money out to several communities across our state to target that population. And that's the kind of advocacy and thinking about crossing systems how can we not just focus on the criminal justice system, but realize that all of our decisions are implicating the healthcare system, the education system, the foster care system. So that's the work that I think that this district attorney needs to do is look locally and partner with all the local entities uh, to say, how can we pull in the same direction? Because I'll tell you frequently, the criminal justice system actually sets people backwards. If they're in line for treatment, they're on a waiting list to get to, to drug and alcohol treatment, and they get arrested and they spend a night in jail, they go back to the back of the line. So we need to be on the same page. We need to be working on the same uh, and pulling in the same direction to say, if this person's trying to engage in treatment, uh, let's make sure that we don't do anything to interrupt that so that they can actually get at the root causes of the problem. And then let's be the people who use data to bring it to the legislature and say, this is an investment, and not just the legislature, but healthcare, hospitals, they have a stake in this. They can make investments in this area that will save them money in the emergency departments. So I think you know, it's, it's a coordinated uh, approach and not just using the, the same old tools we've been using because we can see what we've been doing has not been working. So we're gonna end with this question. In your opinion, should the DA play a greater role in civic life in Portland? And if so, what should that look like? Mike, can you start that question? Absolutely. I absolutely think the DA can play a greater role in, in our civic community. You know, uh, I think as Ethan and I will both attest, you know, running for, for office, you really put yourself out there. Uh, and it, it can be a, a tough process when you're sharing your ideas and, and you know, different sectors of the community uh, accept them or, or not. But what, it's a necessary process, and it's been really a great community building process, I think. Uh, I'm very proud to be endorsed by not only uh, tons of labor groups across our community, like the Portland Teachers, uh, AFSCME, AFL-CIO, uh, the Grocers, but also by community groups like Apano and the Latino Network and Pacoon and East County Rising. I think building those relationships uh, is gonna be crucial and it's something that doesn't end with the campaign. It's something that I'm gonna bring in with me to the district attorney's office uh, if I end up getting elected. Uh, and what does that look like to just not just say, oh, I'm gonna bring people to the table uh, flippantly, but what does it actually look like to work with those groups? It's something I've been doing for the last six years down in Salem, uh, you know, going into ways and means when we're advocating for more budget for, for drug courts and we're advocating for more budget for justice reinvestment, having all those groups behind me to say, this is an investment that makes sense. Uh, have them have buy-in to what the district attorney's office vision is for their communities. Uh, I've talked to some of these groups about how we could leverage their infrastructure and networks. Uh, for example, Apano uh, has a brand new beautiful building out on Southeast 82nd uh, that I think would uh, I've talked with them about would be an amazing space for them to uh, reach out to their networks for an, an expungement clinic uh, so that the district attorney and a defense attorney and a judge can come to them and they can put it out into their community. So if people are eligible for expungements, let's get those convictions off their record. They've done the, the hard work that they need to do. Let's help them by taking down some of those barriers. So I think it's, it's thinking about how can we build on the relationships that we formed throughout this race 
to bring them into a more coordinated strategy. Something else I've talked a lot about is uh, restorative justice. Uh, and I've talked with uh, Unite Oregon about how way they could use their community of uh, groups that they're affiliated with a lot of immigrant communities uh, so that we could build trust in those communities through restorative justice programs uh, and help them make uh, hold people accountable, but hold accountable to their communities. Um, those are things that we can do that don't necessarily take lots of budget or anything else, uh, but they're strategies that will build trust. Uh, and I think that's what is going to be uh, necessary as a, as a civic leader uh, in, in our local system to bring community groups who, who really, quite frankly, haven't been a big part of the conversation and, and don't feel like their, their needs uh, have been heard for a long time. Ethan, your thoughts on the role of the DA? Well, I think uh, Mike and I are in agreement that the role needs to be one uh, where the district attorney is uh, more forward leaning in civic space, but I look at it a little differently. Uh, and it comes from my view of the role of uh, the district attorney as a public advocate and an independent advocate, and that's what the community needs. Uh, you know, we have to remember that at the end of the day, the district attorney still is responsible for prosecuting crimes. And last year, that was roughly 10,000 crimes. Uh, and that is the core role. So from that role, uh, what can the district attorney do in the community? Uh, and, you know, I think it's about credibility and it's about reminding people and educating the public that this core function is essential for our viability as a community. And outreach is incredibly important. And I envision a district attorney who does more outreach, who's actively uh, looking forward and leaning forward to many groups. Uh, but it means something that I'm supported by every district attorney in that office, the current elected district attorney, and the folks in the legal community who are in the orbit of this role. Because they recognize, I think, what I do, which is this is not just another political job. It's not a role for a politician. It's a role for somebody independent and somebody who really understands that to be a district attorney, to be an effective district attorney, you need to be credible and independent and an advocate for your community, regardless of the consequences and the cost sometimes. And that's precisely what I will do. And so I see the role as one that is going to have to change. And we need a DA who's going to be out there, out front and leading. Uh, but I see that as someone coming from a place of independence and a place of understanding of what the system does. Could you each provide uh, us with your final thoughts, your closing thoughts before we uh, end today's forum? And Ethan, feel free to start. No, absolutely. Uh, and I won't belabor the point because I think I just sort of did that in many ways. Uh, but I again think that this is an incredibly important role uh, and it's a role uh, that hasn't really been vetted or tested by the voters in decades. Uh, and it's one that will impact uh, the shape of our community uh, in large and small ways for decades to come. And, but I also think uh, that to make changes in the system, uh, to do the work that the system requires the district attorney do, uh, one needs to be in a position where they understand and have the credibility uh, in support of those in the criminal justice system. And that's how I see the role and that's where I see my candidacy fitting into the larger public space going forward. Uh, so having said that, uh, thanks everyone for giving uh, me the opportunity to speak to you today. I wish it could have been in person, uh, but thanks so much. Hi. Yeah. Uh, yes, thank you for all for having us. You know, um, I think that we are in unprecedented times, obviously, uh, and a lot of things are going to change and a lot of things uh, are going to be changed for, for quite some time. We are clearly going to be facing a budget crisis at every single level city, county, state, and at the federal, federal government level. Uh, so we need somebody who is going to be able to, to navigate through those hard times. Uh, the coronavirus is not something that you can put on trial or interrogate or investigate. Uh, this is going to be something that requires somebody who has a, a strategy and a network and relationships with the folks that are going to help this district attorney's office get through what is going to be very tough budgetary times. That's why I'm incredibly proud to be supported by city council members, by the entire county commission, uh, by all the legislators that control all of those different budgetary levels that I talked about earlier, uh, and by Governor Kate Brown uh, in this race. You know, I have the support of the leaders that are going to be crucial to helping not only our local community, but this office 
navigate uh, what is going to be a really challenging uh, place. So uh, I really appreciate you know the opportunity to to talk to all of you. Ultimately, this is a job interview. Uh, elections are a job interview. Uh, you all, the voters of Multnomah County, uh, get to have a say in, in who you hire uh, to be the next district attorney's office. Uh, and I just put forth my resume as somebody who has uh, over five years experience running a state agency, who has done the prosecution work and understands that, uh, but also has gotten out of the prosecutor, uh, the prosecutor role and out of that working with other system partners, building those relationships, having the support of all the folks that are gonna be necessary to navigate this office through these incredibly challenging times as we're all gonna be looking for new ways to do more with less. Uh, so I hope that on May 19th, I have your support. And, and again, thank you, Noel, and thanks to everybody else for, for hosting this. Thank you. Uh, we could continue to talk about this for much longer, but unfortunately, we've run out of time. I wanna thank the candidates for their time this morning. Andrew, I'm gonna send this back to you. Noel, thank you so much for moderating this forum and to uh, Ethan and to Mike. Thank you. This was an incredibly insightful and very dignified conversation that we just hosted. To all of our attendees who are listening in right now, I hope you found this information valuable. And of course, we are extremely fortunate here in Oregon to be able to vote by mail. Uh, who would have thought the, the absolute critical nature of having that opportunity? So there is absolutely no reason to cast your ballots upcoming in the election. We encourage you to do so and remind everyone that our next opportunity is coming up here on April 22nd at 3 p.m., where we will hear from Governor Kate Brown uh, on any number of issues. And I'm looking forward to that conversation. To our candidates, again, thank you. To our moderator, thank you. And to our sponsors, KeyBank and the Portland Tribune, much appreciated. I hope everyone stays healthy, stays home, stays safe, and take care of yourselves. Thank you.